Well, greetings, everyone, and uh, welcome to this class on Crimes Against Humanity. I confess that this is the second time I've recorded this lecture. The first time I had just finished, uh, there was a problem with the audio. So this is uh, take two, unfortunately. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about Crimes Against Humanity. It, it segues nicely from war crimes and I think reveals much about international criminal justice. So there are several things I want to do with you today uh, as we discuss Crimes Against Humanity. Um, and they are as follows. Uh, I want to go through the historical origins of crimes against, you with, of, against humanity with you, because I think they reveal a lot about the contours of, of the offense and the politics of international criminal justice as well. Um, as you'll see, there've been uh, various changes and opening up of crimes against humanity in different iterations of the offenses. And that opening up has uh, very important political uh, ramifications and implications for the identity of the field. I want you to appreciate how these definitions have changed and by appreciating this you'll understand what crimes against humanity mean, what the legal concept is, but also uh, as I say the shifting political uh, ideas that animate these crimes. Three is sort of something I've referenced in one and two already. That is, I'm, I'm really interested in helping you gain an insight into the politics of defining crimes against humanity because I think they reveal something important about the field. I then have a set of three examples that are at the forefront of thinking about crimes against humanity and international criminal law broadly. Uh, one of the things I'll explore with you is how, and that I've referenced previously in any rate, is how when uh, politically different political constituencies see leverage to be gained by recouching and framing their political agenda within a language of international crimes in general and crimes against humanity in particular, uh, that work can be done and can be leveraged to have different political consequences, either rhetorical or practical. And so what I'm trying to do is to highlight for you different ways in which um, different activist groups are doing this. I don't posit necessarily that it's a, a great thing, um, but I do want to situate it within the two poles that we've discussed at, uh, from the beginning. One is the tendency to politically instrumentalize international criminal justice and concerns uh, that we viewed in the critical dimensions of our cast. And on the other, uh, an attempt to sort of harness moral outrage and objection um, to, to bring about international trials uh, that do something about the many egregious political problems in the world. So again, I hope these examples give you food for thought between those two poles. And as I've done just now, I, I really want to situate these ideas in wider discussions about um, the function of international criminal justice, the theory, the history, I really want you to emerge with a critical appraisal of crimes against humanity and the work that they could do. So without further ado, let me move on to discuss the history of crimes against humanity. And what's nice about uh, moving now into the sort of the uh, substance of international crimes is that we're armed with quite a lot of understanding about this history already. So let's go ahead and look at the history of crimes against humanity. The first uh, significant development that, that's sort of uh, shared in the history of crimes against humanity is the Armenian Genocide. And uh, the Armenian Genocide was significant because it was uh, a set of atrocities that took place within Armenia and was to a large extent, uh, subsumed within a single na single nation state, and that brought um, international law face to face with the limitations of sovereignty, which we discussed previously in Nuremberg. The idea up until that juncture was international uh, law generally, not just international criminal law, but international law generally is about state to state relations, and it will have nothing to say about this sphere of sovereignty, which remains purely the business of each and every nation state, do whatever you like within your nation state, international law won't have anything to say about it or interfere. 
And so on that basis, um, traditionally, it had been the providence of nation states to oppress peoples, minorities, and so on and so forth. It wasn't international law's business to say much about that. But the Armenian genocide was of a sufficient magnitude and really spectacular magnitude that a number of states uh, made uh, international statements referencing crimes against humanity and coupling these references to crimes against humanity with the idea of accountability and punishment. And this was really a bold new idea. Uh, the idea featured in an initial Treaty of Sev that was an attempt to uh, address, uh, bring peace uh, after this process, but was ultimately abandoned, leaving the Treaty of Sev to be just a draft. Uh, and it was replaced by the Treaty of Lausanne which no longer referenced these ideas of crimes against humanity. So what emerges in this period after uh, Armenian genocide is, and during the Armenian genocide is this sort of rhetorical reference to crimes against humanity. But, but really it wasn't until Nuremberg that the Nuremberg Tribunal would suddenly build this apparatus of criminal law around crimes against humanity. And the reason that it did this was because it simply couldn't tolerate the idea that uh, crimes by the German state against German nationals would be left unpunished. They were so widespread and uh, egregious that it was time to get over this intense fixation on sovereignty as a limitation on international law and open it up to some at least um, scrutiny based on massive human rights violations against one's own nationals. And so Nuremberg was really the, the place, the location where this opening up initially took place. But of course, as you start going about opening up ideas of sovereignty, you expose, you expose yourself to scrutiny. And by exposing yourself to scrutiny, uh, a lot of states would work quite hard to define crimes against humanity, at least in their initial manifestations, in such a way that um, they captured the realities of national socialism in Germany and the crimes within Germany against Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, and so forth, but at the same time insulated themselves from major human rights problems uh, in their own nations. And the principal way that the United States did this. The United States, remember, was at the vanguard of the Nuremberg process initially and also the Tokyo process. It was the driving force for them. The way the United States did this was to limit crimes against humanity to circumstances where there was an armed conflict taking place. And so the basic idea, the supposition was that um, crimes against humanity would be exceptions to the to the normal rule that, listen, do whatever you want within your sovereign state, it would be exceptions that involve massive human rights violations against your own people in the context of a surrounding war. And that in the context of surrounding war operated to limit the United States' exposure to allegations of crimes against humanity for, against African Americans in the South of the United States which were also widespread, systematic. Uh, there were African-Americans being discriminated against in an in overt manner in, at the time. There were lynchings, there was much violence. And so suddenly you observe these politics at play in the mere construction of international crimes and crimes against humanity. It is very much about victor's justice in the definition of the crimes themselves. And yet we will see a sort of an opening of these restrictions and definitions in ways that radically increase the ambit, the scope of crimes against humanity. And that should give rise to a whole series of interesting concerns about the role of international criminal justice, whether it can keep all of the promises that it's making and what the broader uh, utility is of offenses of, of this sort in a global order like the one that we have. And so what I want to do is I want to go through different iterations of crimes against humanity with you over history to show 
to the sort of opening up and de-shackling of crimes against humanity from limitations that they have uh, traditionally had. And then give you some examples of, of what really are at the forefront in applications based on that uh, historical progression. So this is the definition of the crimes against humanity in the ICTY statute. As soon as you see ICTY statute, you should remember our earlier class and understand that the ICTY was an institution that was created by the UN Security Council. And because created by the UN Security Council, um, this statute is sort of, um, was earnest to disassociate itself with the history of international criminal law at Nuremberg, which was Victor's justice and created after the fact. And so the ICTY and the Security Council would be very eager to try and establish that these crimes were uh, pre-existing in customary international law at the times that they occurred in the former Yugoslavia. And so this initial definition of crimes against humanity uh, was interesting in that it tried to remain true to the understanding at Nuremberg. And so what you'll see when you read this definition is in the initial part, there's a reference to jurisdiction over persons responsible for the following crimes when committed in armed conflict. Voila, there is the limitation the United States inserted to limit the scope of crimes against humanity at Nuremberg. Uh, and again, regardless of whether the, the conflict is inter international or internal in character, and directed against any civilian population. And then beneath that, there are um, what's described as enumerated crimes for murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, imprisonment, torture, rape, persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds, and other inhumane acts. Now, before we proceed, I want to just describe briefly a sort of a division of labor between a chapeau at the top and then the enumerated crimes underneath it from A to I. Um, and William Shabas has a, a nice way of describing uh, the, the, the chapeau. He says, well, I don't know what you call it in, uh, English, in French, but in English we call it the chapeau. And there's something about this relationship between the chapeau and the enumerated crimes that's very important for your understanding. And that is that the chapeau is intended to delineate a sort of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. And once that's established, an individual can be convicted of one of the enumerated acts if he or she just commits one rape in the context of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. What's interesting is that this language of widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population is something that emerges in the Yugoslav tribunal's case law immediately and then is adopted in subsequent iterations of um, uh, statutes of international criminal law. And we'll see that in different ways, shapes or forms. What's also very interesting for you to understand is that in one of its very first decisions, the same judge who was instrumental in saying there are war crimes in non-international armed conflict, also says, oh yeah, you know this armed conflict uh, <coughs> issue? Oh yeah, that's disappeared in customary international law. And in Nuremberg, it was just a, it was just a jurisdictional connection. Now in customary international law, it's clear that um, crimes against humanity can be perpetrated regardless of the connection with armed conflict. And this, ladies and gentlemen, radically increases the scope of crimes against humanity. This, of course, has the effect of making human rights violations the world over that are systemic and not linked to sort of armed violence necessarily. The legitimate subject of international courts and tribunals, local courts, universal jurisdictions, suddenly there's this huge opening up of capacity of international criminal justice uh, and it takes on this sort of expansionist uh, ideology. Having lived through segments of that ideology and participated in different ways, uh, I think it's clear that it was very well 
meaning and people had this sort of bold idea that suddenly international criminal justice time had arrived and that this was going to be a truly emancipatory development for human rights globally. I, I suspect that uh, most people would agree that, that that enthusiasm has waned very substantially and there's a much more critical voice of which we heard much from uh, Frederick McGray, which wonders whether in fact international criminal law um, was part of a neoliberal campaign that made things worse rather than better. And we can discuss more about that one way or the other. Nonetheless, to come back to this particular definition, what we see is, at least in the statute, a linkage to armed conflict, which courts quickly interpret away. And we see no reference to widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population in Chapo, which courts interpret in, and then other statutes endorse. And we see a relatively limited list of enumerated acts A to I, uh, which an individual can be uh, held responsible for committing. Shall I say a little bit more based on a, um, a fictitious example about the relationship between the chapeau and the enumerated acts? I do think it's important for your understanding. So maybe I'll do that in the context of the Rwanda Tribunal Statute, which is now. So I've replicated just the chapeau of the Rwanda statute. The, the remaining enumerated acts are the same. Um, and what I want you to observe is that the ICTR statute, also promulgated by the Security Council only a, a year after the ICTY statute, already reflects this change in focus. It focuses on this idea of widespread or systematic attack. Widespread denotes repetition or volume of human rights violations. Systematic involves um, a policy or plan. Uh, and then it includes this idea of national, political, ethnic, racial, or religious grounds. And what's really conspicuous in the Rwandan uh, tribunal's definition is the absence of any sort of connection to armed Attacks. Suddenly, crimes against humanity have become this notion that can reach into state sovereignty and hold individuals accountable for massive or widespread, excuse me, massive or systematic human rights violations that cause murder, rape, etc., etc., etc. So that's a very significant different uh, change, ladies and gentlemen, and one that has really sweeping implications for the role of international criminal justice. <laughs> What's really interesting in interpreting a statute, the ICTR, which has a common appeals chamber with the uh, ICTY, seizes upon this language on national, political, ethnic, racial, or religious grounds to say, oh, that too is just jurisdictional because those words seem to imply that all of the crimes had to be carried out on a discriminatory basis but persecution is the only enumerated crime that has to be carried out on a discriminatory basis. The rest do not. And so even this emphasis on national, political, ethnic, racial, or religious grounds dies away in the next iteration at the International Criminal Court. And here is a, a significant part of the ICC's statute, which of course is um, codified in 1998 after these institutions. And what you'll know about the notice about the chapeau is that it also adopts this idea of widespread or systematic attacks. They're disjunctive, meaning that you could have a systematic attack that doesn't lead to a lot of victims, but nonetheless is um, based on a policy or agenda that's directed against the civilian population with knowledge of the attack. Again, no linkage to armed conflict. Now, what I've done in the enumerated acts beneath it is I've just listed the things that are different in the enumerated acts because states took this ball and ran with it. They took the idea that crimes against humanity should be enlarged even further and um, augmented the scope of crimes against humanity 
in the ways that I've listed uh, in G, H, I, J, and K. So most significantly, most importantly, the list of sexual violations was increased quite significantly, and this is uh, very important. I think in previous lectures we talked about how um, women's experience of war was largely ignored in the history of international criminal justice. There were no prosecutions for rape, for instance, at Nuremberg uh, or Tokyo. And it wasn't until, well, the, the grave breaches regime of war crimes, for instance, in 1949 and the additional protocols in 1977 didn't even make rape a grave breach of the um, Geneva Conventions. And so there was a really an important push to remedy this by criminalizing a whole series of differentiated uh, sexual forms of sexual violence in war that included rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and a catch-all, which was other forms of sexual violence of comparable gravity. Another development that was very interesting uh, along similar lines, although came with its own slightly shameful uh, reference that harked back to some of the excesses that really had uh, given rise to crimes against humanity in the first place, was an inclusion of gender in the definition of persecution. If you look at previous iterations, gender wasn't included. And this is, is laud laudable and important uh, that gender would be a basis for um, a conviction for persecution if you're discriminating on, uh, on the basis of gender. The aspect that was uh, embarrassing is that in the Rome Statute, there is a footnote on gender which says that gender will only be interpreted uh, to mean biological sex. So the idea is it, it would be limited to um, men and women, excluding sexual orientation as a basis for persecution. And the this is highly problematic on its own and deeply regrettable, uh, especially when homosexuality was um, such a target for crimes against humanity in Nazi Germany. Uh, it, it seems like um, there was an opportunity to, to let crimes against humanity reflect lessons learned from that period, which states proved reluctant uh, to adopt. So I is enforced disappearances of persons uh, that reflect parallel developments. I think I referenced like Pinochet dropping 20,000 people out of planes through enforced disappearances. This really was the experience of uh, South America as a means of, of control uh, during the Cold War. And so it was meaningful and important that enforced disappearances would be included in the definition of crimes against humanity. Likewise, apartheid was included um, in light of the harrowing experience in, of apartheid in South Africa. Um, attempts to, to define apartheid in stronger terms were defeated by Western governments that viewed it as potentially um, undermining of, of them in similar ways to uh, the way in which the United States tried to restrictively define crimes against humanity to limit it to armed conflict. So again, in apartheid, there are politics writ large throughout the ways in which the offense is constructed. And then finally, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but other iterations of crimes against humanity had also included a category of other inhumane acts. And if you recall our class on um, non-retroactivity of criminal law and the ideas of criminal law being defined in very strict terms so as to preserve freedom and allow individuals to make choices about how to comport themselves with criminal law, we observed how there were some really quite significant misgivings about a catch-all phrase that could mean anything judges and prosecutors wanted it to. That seemed illiberal, that seemed uh, potentially in line with the sort of authoritarian use of criminal law in precisely the sorts of societies that uh, international criminal law was being called to judge. And certain judges in uh, ad hoc tribunals had refused to apply it for those reasons. And so there's an attempt at the ICC level to limit the scope of other inhumane acts to 
those similar character intentionally causing great suffering or serious body injury to body or to mental or to physical health. Uh, again, there will still be a number of people who view that as insufficient given the breadth of what that sort of category might encompass. What I hope you observe in all of this is a gradual growth of crimes against humanity in the 1990s and um, a creation of a, of a set of norms that really has very far reaching implications if applied objectively. Uh, again, this brings us in direct conflict with concerns about whether international criminal justice can ever be that. I wanted to say just a couple of words about uh, the elements of crimes against humanity. And there are five in particular that I want to go through with you. The first is an attack. And the ICC statute defines an attack as um, a course of conduct involving the multiple commissions of acts referred to in paragraph one, which paragraph one is the enumerated crimes. And so for the chapeau, you require an attack against the civilian population. And to define an, an attack against the civilian population, it's just multiple iterations of murder, rape, uh, extermination, so on and so forth. Um, so there's an interesting sort of symbiotic relationship between the chapeau and the enumerated acts in the form of sort of a cross-reference in the term attack. Again, I sort of referenced this earlier, but widespread or systematic attack, the word wide, the phrase widespread refers to the large scale nature of the attack and the number of victims, whereas the phrase systematic refers to the organized nature of the acts of violence and the improbability of their random occurrence. Note that widespread and systematic are disjunctive, so you only need one of them. And that gives rise to the possibility on the one hand of of uh, large scale human rights violations that aren't intended or that aren't planned. And on the other, a very limited number of human rights violations that are done deliberately. Now, a number of people say, well, that's extremely broad. Perhaps you wanna make them conjunctive, make, they have to be widespread and systematic, but no courts have ever interpreted crimes against humanity in that fashion, leaving an international crime that has potentially very broad sweep. Any civilian population is also defined in very broad terms. So it includes people who are not taking part in active hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms. And so when we say civilian population, we're not even excluding soldiers necessarily. Uh, it has a very broad ambit. Again, I, I wanted to emphasize the link between the chapeau and the enumerated acts. If, for instance, uh, there's an armed group in Melbourne that rounds up 50,000 people and detains them illegally, um, and that's all that they do, for argument's sake, one soldier who gets, commits an act of rape in that context commits rape as a crime against humanity because his conduct is connected to a widespread or systematic attack against civilians, the imprisonment and detention, uh, and the rape took part as part of that widespread or systematic attack. So it's quite a significant insight that the individual soldier doesn't, him or herself, have to be responsible for widespread or systematic uh, crimes. It's just that the conduct that he or she undertakes that amounts to one of the enumerated acts has to be connected to other people's widespread or systematic attack. And then you have to find the final aspect is to find one of the enumerated crimes, be it deportation, unlawful transfer, be it murder, be it um, sexual violence or any of the other enumerated offenses. So that's sort of an overview of the history of crimes against humanity, uh, how it came to take the form that it has now, the broad sweep of that. Uh, international crime and some of the political ramifications of how it came to look like this.
So what I wanted to do now to end this is to show you a set of videos uh, that serve as examples of issues that people have attempted to use crimes against humanity to um, address. And they're all issues at what I think is the forefront of the field and examples of the ways in which activists will attempt to um, harness crimes against humanity and international criminal law to frame their political concerns precisely because they see different sorts of leverage in international criminal law that just mere public complaint or moral conjecture doesn't offer them. So the, each of the videos is about five or six minutes long. I'll include the videos uh, in this and then we'll wrap up and, and have a conversation about them. I should say, I know absolutely nothing about the veracity of the claims made in any of these three videos or about the nature of the organizations that made them. So I'm including them here just to show that these sorts of allegations are being made, not to endorse them in any way, shape or form. So what's interesting about that story about environmental pollution is that there is a, a group of people um, who are interested in describing that type of environmental damage as a crime against humanity because it has such negative health implications for local populations because it leads to such important displacement. Uh, and uh, there's a Center for Climate Crime Analysis, which is a, run by an individual who's a friend, uh, and he is actually an appeals counsel at the International Criminal Court. Uh, and, and in parallel, he runs this Center for Climate Crime Analysis, uh, which is an NGO focusing on the ways in which criminal law can be useful in addressing climate change and environmental damage uh, type issues. He uses this framing to generate political leverage in a number of different ways and to pursue accountability in a variety of different fora, one of which employs the framing of crimes against humanity to generate different sorts of leverage. And in this report that you see before you, uh, his NGO couples with source to produce a report that is sent to the Norwegian Pension Fund. There's also a version of this report which uh, houses this analysis with an analysis uh, or framing of crimes against humanity, which really is a very sophisticated piece of uh, research into the ways in which the actions of the company are causing different forms of harm that might be considered crimes against humanity. And although this report was never intended to be focused on criminal accountability for crimes against humanity. It, it informed the decision of the Norway, Norwegian Pension Fund to delist the company uh, on human rights grounds, which had at least a $1 billion consequence for the company. So it's an interesting use of human rights uh, for those purposes and, um, and an example of human rights uh, at the, ver at the very uh, forefront of crimes against humanity and ways of using that in ways that are, are relevant today. The next example is land grabbing. And uh, this is an example that emerges out of Cambodia. I struggled to find a, a decent video that would depict the issues for you. But the essence of the problem is that uh, land grabbing now is a phenomenon where coalitions of uh, corrupt military uh, and politicians locally collaborate with foreign investors to forcibly evict very substantial numbers of people from their properties so that those uh, that grouping of uh, actors can forcibly seize land, uh, begin agricultural and other types of industrial pro uh, processes that enrich them personally at the huge expense of, of local populations who are evicted. Uh, again, there, is, there are attempts to um, use crimes against humanity, especially displacement or deportation or unlawful tra transfer as arguments for thinking about these substantial land grabbings as crimes against humanity. Um, and I can show you a complaint to the International Criminal Court afterwards and we'll go through the, the uh, table of contents of that to sort of reveal the different structure about it, how it's being used. So uh, the video is significant for a, a range of reasons, but one of the 
the ways I wanted to show you how these sorts of phenomena are being considered as acts of uh, deportation or unlawful transfer uh, as crimes against humanity is through communications to the International Criminal Court. So essentially one does a very detailed analysis of, uh, of the facts and processes it through the framing of crimes against humanity and the law that we just witnessed in an attempt to generate a different kind of political leverage over it and potentially to harness institutions capable of enforcing international criminal court, criminal law, uh, be they international courts or, or local courts. And so here's a, a report that runs to 220 odd pages. And I just want to go through the structure of it with you to highlight sort of uh, how the elements of what we've witnessed in Crimes Against Humanity play out. So in the executive summary, you see Crimes Against Humanity as a core element of what's being argued after the factual, factual background. And part two is preliminary matters, which talks about the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction. Uh, part three is factual overview, which includes kleptocracy, land grabbing, and first of all, transfer as a vehicle for self-enrichment um, and maintaining power. Um, part four is explicitly about crimes against humanity that deals with chapeau elements, like I described. Uh, and then the underlying crimes in part four is the enumerated crimes of what I described as such. And the report deals with forcible transfer um, in general and, and of indigenous minorities. It deals with murder, imprisonment or severe deprivation of physical liberty, other inhuman act, human acts that we saw and persecution. So it's a detailed report. And again, it goes to the International Criminal Court and there's a desire to to have the International Criminal Court exercise jurisdiction over this phenomenon, uh, or at least to assert complementarity that places pressure on national courts to do exactly that. And in fact, this is a, a report that was carried, uh, undertaken by um, the, my law school in Vancouver, Canada here that has a human rights clinic that, that really did a, a groundbreaking uh, report, no pun intended, on investigating and prosecuting land grabbing as an international crime. And uh, you can download that and view it if you're interested. This brings us to our third and final uh, example, which I think is useful for you. Uh, this one is about um, disabilities and using crimes against humanity as a basis for addressing uh, attacks on communities with disabilities. The example that I use here is about um, crimes against those assumed to be in the drug trade in the Philippines. And those crimes sort of go in two directions. One is against anyone who's accused of being a drug dealer. But there's also systematic assassinations of those who are drug addicts. And if one conceives of drug addicts as individuals with uh, disabilities, it's interesting to think about deploying the language of crimes against humanity to address widespread systematic attacks uh, of both sorts. So I'll show you the video again. This one lasts five to six minutes. Uh, hopefully it's helpful and sets the stage for a conversation we can have afterwards. So that is about all that I wanted to share with you uh, initially uh, about crimes against humanity. Um, the last example, I guess, is, is provocative and uh, other students that I've had conversations with feel like um, it's imperialistic on a part of international criminal justice. It's sort of neo-colonial to think about uh, using crimes against humanity to describe difficult situations of the sort other people feel more strongly about um, people with addictions as having disabilities and right to fair trial. Um, so I'm interested to have conversations with you about both the history of crimes against humanity and the, the, uh, the examples that I provided at the end. So thank you so much.